Hello. So we're live. <laughs> How are you? Hi. How are you doing? Hi. So are we introducing ourselves today? Well, wait a minute. Okay. I said an error occurred. Wait a moment and then try again. Oh, okay. Okay. Hello. It's, it's great yeah. to see you again. Uh, we're live here on Facebook and on YouTube. And uh, we're going to prove to have an interesting show here. Here I have with me Julianne Davis, and, and she's uh, quite well known for her role in Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut, that is really a, truly a classic movie from perhaps the greatest movie director of all time, Stanley Kubrick. And she got to work with, with Tom Cruise and, and uh, all those. Uh, interesting people and and it brought her into a whole circle of of influence and interaction that's really quite fascinating and and really dovetails because she's also uh holds dual citizenship for the u.s and uh with uh, the uk and uh, those that know me from my association with american intelligence media and americans for innovation we've done extensive research over many years regarding the links, uh, regarding the elites and their involvement in US politics. So uh, let's go ahead. Uh, Julianne, why don't you tell us some more about yourself so that- um, Well, I, I started off as a, a fashion model and then I ended up getting, landing the role of Eyes Wide Shut. I had actually auditioned for an extra role and then um, Stanley called me in to meet him at Pinewood because they were already filming. I met him, did a couple screen tests, uh, and then got the part of Mandy, Mandy Curran. Um, and that pretty much, you know, without going into the filming of it, that, that changed my life. Um, before that time, I was just a working model, you know, a jobbing fashion model, an international jobbing fashion model. So. You know, I was going all over. I, I mainly, Europe was my main base, had been since um, pretty much 1989. Um, I lived in Europe for just under 20 years. Um, and during that time, obviously, I became a, a dual citizen. I'm, I'm from this country originally, um, from America, sorry. North America, the United States. <laughs> Canadians don't like that. <laughs> you need to say which part of North America. Anyway, <laughs> um, and after Eyes Wide Shut came out, it catapulted me into a different um, uh, sort of lifestyle, really, if you will, because I started going to a lot of parties. Um, you know, PRs were inviting me to parties, you know, in, in England and abroad and um, meeting uh, you know, the head of the Conservative Party in England, MPs with the Conservative Party, um, bigger stars, big, you know, music stars, bigger acting stars. You know, it was just a whole different level that I was in. And, um, you know, um, going to Monaco and sitting next to now the Crown Prince of Monaco. Um so lots of experiences like that with the either uber famous or uber wealthy um, in, in Europe. Um, and those that are in Europe, obviously, they would travel all over the world. They'd be in Europe, they'd be in, uh, in Russia, they'd be in New York, LA, Hong Kong, you know. So my life became even more sort of international with the as I say, the uber wealthy, uber famous um, circle. Um, so I, I, I got a taste of what that was like. And then also, you know, the, the fashion industry, some of my experiences in the fashion industry, which don't get me wrong, I love. Wonderful industry, it was great. It allowed me to make a lot of money and travel all over the world. So I, you know, I don't discount it, but there's a dark side too, to that. Um, and uh, as I said last time, I believe I did meet Jeffrey Epstein at one point in Paris. Um, so, you know, 
I guess for me, I have this kind of um, sense of justice and what's right. Now, not social justice, but just a, a real sense of what's right and what's wrong. And maybe that's my upbringing. Maybe that's the way my parents brought me up. Um, but I just feel that if I saw something dark or I saw something that was just, just didn't feel right in my gut, um, I either ran from it or I wanted to tell people about it. Uh, so my first experience with being kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, a whistleblower, I suppose, was back in 1994. I think it was around that time, 94. Yeah, I think it was around 94. Um, a friend of mine who's a journalist came to me and said, I want to do a story about the dark side of the fashion industry. And she wanted to do a whole story about the whole heroin chic thing in London. And I said to her, I said, well, you want the real dirt on the fashion industry. You need to go to Paris and London. And that opened up this whole investigation with the BBC and Donald McIntyre and my friend, Lisa Brinkworth. Um, and uh, it, it uncovered a lot of the dark side of the fashion industry. Now, the reason I say this is that that and politics and entertainment um, uh, and international mafia, <laughs> all of these things on this top level kind of converge. Um, and I've discovered that as time goes on. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I, I don't know if I segued or not, but that's <laughs> that's where I'm at. No, that's good because it it, uh, it kind of adds to uh, the credibility as to why would somebody want to be listening to your opinion. Yeah. Um, and my experience is, is different, but there's there's certain similarities. Uh, for many years, I was the uh, manager of the Mayflower Bookshop, which is the largest esoteric alternative and holistic bookstore in the world. And so consequently, I was continually meeting uh, spiritual leaders and authors and healers and everybody from all these various disciplines. And I would help them work through the maze of, of literature because at that time, there, the internet was not a factor. You know, you, right. couldn't, you couldn't just Google it. And, right. Uh, <laughs> get into a subject so you needed to know okay i i did this book and this book now now what and so that was basically my job was helping uh, people of all levels of, of study to be able to move forward because they, we had so many books that, that uh, with their time constraints perhaps it would be helpful for them to have the latest tomes pointed out to them. Yeah. And so that was very interesting. And we had radio shows. Uh, and uh, actually, I did one show on uh, Tower Radio in Detroit, where I explained to people that the Federal Reserve is neither federal, nor do they have any reserves. And basically, what it is, is our uh, financial link to this international cabal that is currently doing uh, the best that they can to try and overturn our elected leader, uh, President Donald Trump. And it happens to be his birthday. So happy birthday, Donald. Yes, I know. Happy birthday. Yay. Go yeah. Trump. <laughs> 20 it's interesting that you know the time that we're going through right now has has a long history and symbolism because when you get into uh, wearing a mask, it it's it's a it's a, a means of burglary, but it's also a, a, a means of of uh, losing your identity. Yes, and it's also, I, I, I just feel like the second you put that thing on, I mean, you know, now we have to, to just to go <laughs> into a shop. But the second you put that thing on, it's almost like you should be saying on your mask, I have been subjugated. I have submitted, you know, it just, it pisses me off to no end. So basically the second before I walk into the shop, I'm like, <clears throat> 
you know? And then the second I walk out, and in fact, most of the time I'm in the shop, I'm like <laughs> putting it down on my chin. I'm like, I'm gonna have a masked beard. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> two fingers to you. Or, oh, you know, this is an interesting thing. I don't know if you know this, you know, when people flip the birdie. In England, the equivalent is not the birdie, but it's it's this, which, okay, let me say the birdie, right? But it's this in England. And I don't know if you know this, being an intellectual, John, and that's one thing that you didn't talk about. I could about, that Quite the intellectual. But <laughs> this means, um, now I can't remember which war or when this happened, but in the old days, um, when they were warring against, when the British were warring against the French, um, they were doing it with their bow and arrow, right? And so when the French would capture the English, what would they do? They would cut off their two fingers. And so the reason why the British would go like this is, you know, screw you, I've still got my two fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's so good, I love that. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's a good one. And the word bloody actually um, sort of uh, evolved from the phrase, by our lady, by our lady, bloody, anyway. Just another segue. Yeah, yeah it's pretty interesting you and I though, the fact that you know you are, um, yes, you've got this esoteric background, but you're also quite an intellectual historian. And um, I think it's a, f a fascinating juxtaposition because you look at things in the respect of um, a lot of detail, historical detail. And I look at it more of a, a sort of a generalized overview of what I observe. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna say that I'm an intellectual, I'm not. However, I do believe that I'm a deep thinker. And I do believe that I look at, um, I don't get lost in the minutia of, of the details, but I look at aspects of those things that stick out to me and I see a bigger picture, a, a fuller picture, a more a lateral picture, which um, I'd say the biggest difference, I think, between um, people like me and you, more conservative, versus people that tend to be progressive, is that progressives tend to look at a linear picture and they look at the here and now if you were to um, describe that uh, more um, visually, it would be like, they're looking at a few trees in the front of the forest, and we're looking at the entire expanse of the forest. And we're even looking at the forest that we had just walked through. And the progressives don't care about the forest that they just walked through. They are looking at the couple of trees that are right in front of them, and that's it. And that's a problem. And I don't know how to reach those people to try to explain that they do need to look at those trees. They need to look at the trees that they've passed through and they need to look at not only the trees that are directly in front of them and why they've been put in front of them, but the rest of the forest that is the whole picture. And not enough of us are doing that. Anyway, yeah. no, I think that that's great, and and being a that I've I've written a couple books, uh, and in there I use uh, astronomical cycles uh, and their relationship to the course of history, which is really quite a fascinating study. And uh, my first book, The Arcana of the Grail Angel, I. I develop a cosmological context, which is a, a, a very big picture, spanning thousands of years, literally. And it's interesting because uh, I also, for 15 years or so, uh, was able to uh, really dive into uh, studies regarding ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia, as I was the basically curator of one of the largest private uh, ancient Egypt and Mesopotamian studies libraries in the world. <clears throat> and that was wonderful. 
you know, and so well, it's absolutely fascinating. And, and, you know, when it comes to those things, uh, especially having to do with Egypt and the pyramids, and then you've got the other pyramids that are in uh, Mexico. Um, there's lots of strange things in the world that I'm sure you've watched ancient aliens to meet just like everybody else. Lots of strange things in the world that have gone on that we can um, hypothesize about what those, what the truths are. Um, but the conclusion that I come to is that I, I guess I remain open. So I'm open to what you've discovered in your reading and in your research. Um, and I'm open to whatever else we manage to discover. However, the one thing that I, that I don't usually do is I'm not gonna come to an absolute conclusion because I feel like the story is just a, it's a, a, a constantly moving story that um, new information will continually come to us. So I prefer to leave things open and if they seem true at the time, okay, they seem true at the time, um, but let's wait and see what other information comes to us. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a view that I, I cherish also. In fact, the, the very first entry in my very first book, I, I deal with the concept of uh, the question, you know, because my first book, The Arcana of the Grail Angels, is a study of the grail. And Rudolf Steiner had, had once made the comment that uh, one of the meanings of the word grail is gradalis, which is, means gradually. And coming from a perspective of, of developing a gradual understanding means that you have to have room in, in your mind for, for new information to come in and not yeah. be a closed set. Uh, I, I frequently make uh, the point uh, that there's, uh, in the dialogues of Plato, Socrates, he says, uh, uh, etsifanite, you know, and basically what that means you know, in, in response to, to what somebody would say, and he would say, and they, they translate that as certainly, which that's like possibly the worst translation of that. It is the worst translation, yes. <laughs> it should be translated, it seems so. And and that's, that's basically where I'm coming from. And you know, it seems so, seems to me to be the more wise, uh, position. Because for anybody to be absolute in this world, in this universe, with our limited brains as humans, is uh, it's arrogant. And I, I think it's dumb to, to do that. I do. I well, think part of the problem is, is that is our education system has been hijacked. Yes. And uh, Many people, have, have, including myself, have, have done podcasts where they lay out the history of the Frankfurt School and how they, yep. were, they were disaffected uh, communists that that uh, converted from here and infiltrated. Yep. Yeah, from political com communism to to uh, what they what they consider to be a social uh, or social communism and 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 that's this whole uh, thing that's been developing in our country that some people look at and go, where is this coming from? What's yeah. wrong with the, all these college kids? They're yeah, it, and it's been around a long, long time. It's just that it's really caught fire. I mean, it started really catching fire in the 60s with the 60s revolution, but now it's really, really caught fire. Um, and that's one thing, I, I, I'm just curious what your views are on are what we call classical liberalism. Um, I, I believe that class, classical liberalism is a, a good thing. However, I think that it can be a, a negligent thing if we do not have our ethical morals in place, or rather ethics and morals in place. 
Um, and the 60s revolution kind of started to destroy that, our ethical, um, our you know, Christian derived ethical um, ethics and morals. Um, and classical liberalism also, we have the attitude of, you know, you are free to think what you will, say what you will, do what you will, um, as long as you don't harm others kind of thing. And I think a lot of people who are classical liberals were thinking, okay, well, you know, I don't really agree with your thoughts on, the, like, for instance, collectivism. I don't really agree, but, you know, you, you think what you will. I'll be just fine. I'm just off having my own life and, you know, following my path. You follow your path, I'll follow my path, and we'll be fine. However, the problem is, is that the collectivists and the Frankfurt School, for instance, um, they weren't happy with other people following their path and they seek to destroy that. And they're seeking to destroy classical liberalism as well. So what do we do about it? Because if we continue to just adhere to, oh, well, you know, you think what you think and I'll think what I think and we'll be fine. Well, that's not working anymore. And in fact, even Putin, not that I'm, you know, aligning myself with Putin. God, I can just imagine all the left is going, oh, my God. <laughs> right. But I mean, even Putin was saying, oh, well, you know, liberalism is dead. Yeah. Well, and, and that's that again, that gets into the replacement of thinking, I guess is what I would call it, to where people no longer uh, think things through. They, they have replaced them with slogans. And if they can get you to just buy into a slogan, you know, yeah. me too, or whatever. And uh, you know, don't you think slogans are based on this kind of um, uh, almost like a, a pseudo sentimentality? Well, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's right out of the Marxist, the neo-Marxist playbook. Is If you can get people to agree with a slogan, then you can motivate people to act. And that's that's a very, very uh, dangerous and tepid waters. Uh, but let me let me share you something. Uh, it was a quotation that, that uh, I, I dug up the other day from Rudolf Steiner uh, regarding socialism. And uh, because it's been disturbing to me that some of the people that consider themselves followers of, of Dr. Rudolf Steiner who founded Waldorf schools and and anthroposophical medicine, and he was a you know, really uh, a leader in so many fields, architecture, art, science, and uh, it just goes on and on. He, he has the largest body of work of the 20th century, being that there's over 6,000 lectures, over 50 published articles and books, and, and all of that. He's, he's Austrian, and the center's in Dornach, Switzerland. But uh, he, in the earlier stages of his career, he would give talks. Uh, and one of the groups in which he, he talked to was a, a, gro a group of Democrat, Democratic Socialists, okay? And- uh, it's so, In itself, an absolute misnomer, isn't it? You well, you know, again, we have to get into defining terms at, at some point, but let me share with you this, this quote. Uh, you want to say something first? Go no, ahead. I'm just going to say democratic socialism doesn't exist because socialism must be enforced. And as soon as you enforce it, it no longer becomes democratic. Right? So anyway. Well, I mean, yeah, but you can go back and you can say, well, how is everybody saying, you know, we're, well, we're in a spreading democracy around the world. Well, wait a minute, because the United States is not a democracy. No, it's we're a republic. A constitutional republic. Yes. And that's a very specific thing. Yes, it is. Um, democracy, democracy is where 51% of the people... Mob rule. ...the other 49% to, to take care of them. Yes, it's mob rule. That's what, yeah, that's rule. what a pure democracy is, mob rule, and they don't understand that. Yeah, it was democracy that led uh, Socrates to take the hemlock, in fact. You know, they decided he was corrupting the youth because he was opening their minds and they didn't like that. 
And so they had him take the hemlock and poison himself. The greatest citizen that they had. But because he was- well, That's interesting though. But isn't that interesting that here's Socrates, what year was this? Well, this is like, you know, uh, sixth century BC, you know? Okay. So this, I find this really interesting because, you know, we talk about the Frankfurt School and, you know, obviously that came over when in the, help me here, what year did the Frankfurt School? Well, they started, they, most of the, the uh, representatives of the Frankfurt School, uh, they came over because of what was going on uh, with the, the uh, Nazis in Germany. Right. Okay, so we're talking right around World War II? Well, yeah. A little bit before? Yes. Yeah. From the 30s into the, into the 40s right. and even some the 30s. Okay. in the 50s. But yeah. isn't it interesting, though, when you look at the, the different types of people, you've got the people that we consider to be on the left, they tend to be either Marxist, collectivist, socialist, communist, et cetera, um, on one side, globalists, right? They tend to all be on that one side. And, um, but, it, you know, so we look at that in a, in a modern spectrum, like, oh, Frankfurt School. But look at the time of Socrates. Those people in the mob did not like their brains open. Those people were looking at those little trees in the front. They weren't looking at what was going on behind. They didn't want to look at the forest in front, you know, all around them. They just wanted to look at those little trees and they didn't like that Socrates was saying, but look at all of this. And then it happened again, French Revolution. I mean, on and on and on. So this is not new. I think that um, humans tend to have, uh, they, they t I don't know, for some reason, they tend to kind of like have the, these two groups of humans. One group that says, well, I don't know, we shall see and let's look at everything. And then there's another group that says, no, 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 I don't care about that. This is important. I'm just going to look at this, just this. <laughs> I don't want to hear what you have to say over there. This is not new. This is, I, and I do believe that this is part of the human, uh, uh, the human equation, the human, um, are, are, are the flawed humanity that we are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rudolf, going back to Rudolf Steiner, his, yep. his major philosophical work uh, came out of his, his, his doctoral thesis, Truth and Knowledge. And, uh, it, but his major philosophical work was uh, the philosophy of freedom, which is uh, really kind of a, uh, a difficult subject when, when you start uh, getting into collectivist systems, because if there's one thing that's, that they don't tolerate, it's freedom. Yeah. Um, and freedom and liberty are, are anathema to any of these totalitarian systems. So let me read this brief quote. Okay. That'll give us uh, some food of thought. Okay. This is from his uh, a lecture cycle that was published as From Symptom to Reality in Modern History. And it, it was, uh, this is from a lecture that was given in Dornach, Switzerland on October 27th, 1918. So it was right in the thick of, of all that, that was going on at that time. Uh, and he says, now it is interesting to note that in these socialist circles, one thing that is of capital importance for our epoch and for the understanding of this epoch was taboo. I could speak on any subject, but when one speaks factually, one can speak today, leaving aside the proletarian prejudices on any and every subject, save that of freedom. To speak of freedom seemed extremely dangerous. I had only a single follower who always supported me whenever I delivered my libertarian tirades, as the others were pleased to call them. It was the Pole, Siegfried Nacht. I do not know what has become of him. He always supported me in my defense of freedom against the totalitarian program of socialism, end quote. So there you have it. And, and yet you'll find amongst Rudolf Steiner's followers there's these, these uh, uh, do-gooders, uh, some might call them tree-huggers, uh, but they seem to think that there's some kind of way you construct government programs 
for the benefit of mankind, and which to me doesn't take into account anything regarding actual human nature. Right. And, and uh, I'm just going to add to that, not just individual human nature, but the human nature of the masses. Because there are some people who I've had conversations with um, who tend to be more on the libertarian conservative side who are atheist, which I feel sorry for them, really, that they're atheist. But um, they insist that man could go beyond um, the idea of believing that there's a creator and believing in any sort of dogma and that they can um, fashion their own sense of ethics and moralities outside uh, some sort of immutable guiding force, if you will. Um, and for me, I think it's lunacy because we are dealing with a flawed humanity. So are you saying, or are people saying that they want to have a flawed humanity construct something for a flawed humanity? It doesn't work for me because it, it, that's when it falls apart. When you've got the masses, <laughs> The, the way they behave and you can't control the way they behave. You, you can't control it. You can try again and again and again, as they have done ad nauseum, but it, it never works. Does it? It never works. No. And, and, and that being said, coming from the, the esoteric Christian viewpoint, uh, Rudolf Steiner gives very detailed descriptions regarding the history of mankind to all its developments. And one of the basic themes in, in his work, which is called Anthroposophy, is the evolution of consciousness. And that the, the Christ principle, which is that which we've received through the deed uh, of Jesus Christ, was, was something that uh, came about and gave us the center of our being, which is the, the I, as, as uh, like with Moses uh, in the burning bush, I, I am that I am. And Rudolf Steiner makes the point that that which uh, Moses was able to experience externally uh, actually became uh, internalized uh, at the baptism in, in Jesus and the Christ the cosmic being of Christ actually entered into him and, and took up the garments of the human realm. And, and the, the challenge that we're faced with is, is between two fundamental challenges. One is the Luciferic, which is, says the, the material world is all illusion. And on the other hand, is the Aramonic, or what many would call satanic, and that's the, the spiritual world is an illusion. You know, you're just a uh, sophisticated animal. And so the Christ principle is meant to be a balance between those two extremes. And he, he makes the point in, in uh, 1906 in Berlin on November 22nd, he says, the good could have become reality without Lucifer, but not freedom. In order to choose the good, we must also have the evil before us. Yep, and that's what a lot of atheists don't understand. They say, if there was a God, you wouldn't have this kind of evil in the world. But yeah. I say the ultimate in creation is to create something free that can choose between good and evil. Because otherwise, if, if the only thing that we can choose is good, then we're just simply automatons. We're robots. Exactly. And so the quotation continues. He says, it must exist within us as self-love. When the force of self-love is developed and widened to become love of all, evil will be overcome. Evil and freedom stem from the same original source. Lucifer kindled human enthusiasm for the divine. He's the light bearer. The Elohim are the light itself. Lucifer brought light to human beings by kindling in them the light of wisdom, albeit mingled with the black shadow of evil. The wisdom Lucifer brings is shrunken and blemished, 
but it penetrates into mortals. He brings external science that serves egoism. That is why selflessness in regard to knowledge is demanded of the esoteric student, end quote. So there you have a, a framing. Now, whether or not- I would love if on the YouTube, you actually, you it, you know, in the, the bit underneath us, that yeah, you- Yeah, I'll put that in. That's, yeah, I'll put, I'll put that's an incredibly things. powerful quote. And in fact, just to bring up one of the first things that he mentioned about, mm -hmm. about self-love, isn't it fascinating that the left today in, in, in the modern world have been talking about not self-love so much, but self-care. And self-care is not what we're talking about, a kind of respect for self, respect for the, the soul that you are that has been created by God, but actually more of a kind of narcissistic uh, caring for oneself, like an, a narcissistic and egotistical care for oneself um, at, the, at the expense of others. Have you noticed that? How they've taken some of these, these elements and they've twisted them yes. uh, to make it work. And, and uh, you know, I see the evil in that. I, I see it. A lot of people don't. And uh, yeah, it disturbs me. Well, you know, as it should, and 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 that's a good thing. I mean, we're down here to be challenged. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the journey of life, isn't it? Yeah. That is the that is the journey. It's yeah. you are you are here, you are free, you are given the choice between doing good, doing evil. Um, and it is your life's journey to be able to strive you know, to achieve as much as you, whatever you've been given to achieve that for good um, and to reach higher heights for good, for the ultimate good. Yeah, um, it, there's an old Chinese saying, may I be cursed to be born in interesting times. And I think that uh, that's where we are right now. I mean, it's just like uh, almost incomprehensible in the extent to which people have allowed themselves to, to get into the, the, the herd mentality. It's just, and, and really, if you talk to these people, they can't elaborate on anything. They just have their feelings about this or feelings yes. about that. I mean. Well, they have, the, they have the set labels that they call you um, and then they cut you off immediately. So yeah, sure. I've been called every every single name in the book. Um, more recently, um, an actress who I hired for a film. Um, she's a serious progressive activist, was protesting on the street. She's a, I've only commented on her page maybe three times in the last couple of years. And she said, quote, I'm sick of your poo, basically, <laughs> word word. I'm sick of this. And, uh, you know, I'm done with you. And then she blocks me. <laughs> yeah. Just, okay. So not willing to have a conversation, not willing to, uh, to even, even look at another point of view because they've been told that that other point of view is evil and bad. So I'm not even going to look at it. You know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go through life with these blinders on in my, my old, my whole SJW um, linear way of thinking. Well, not all, not everybody in entertainment is 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 on the left. I mean, I see my buddy uh, Wally, including me. <laughs> I'm not on. Wally has joined in here, and he's uh, from the Romantics. He also played in Ringo Starr's band, and oh, he's, cool. he's a happy conservative. Uh, exactly what that might mean, uh, I leave that up to people. I. Personally, if, if you look at, at, at the points that Rudolf Steiner is trying to make is that in order for this, this Christ principle that he's talking about to be able to come about in the right way, in a wholesome way, it has to be given the freedom to make the decision. Yeah. So consequently, what Araman wants to do and Lucifer, they, they, they team up on us and they want to try and, and reduce... Uh, our, our opportunities to be able to make free decisions. You know, this whole yes. uh, tendency towards uh, 
the robotic, uh, you know, like we're being censored by robots now, you know, it's like. Literally, yes. Yeah, literally, there's, there's subroutines written into the software that if you go in a certain direction, it's going to uh, limit your exposure or even delete you completely. And so oh, kind of I, I now know just to, just to demonstrate that it's really interesting because I, you know, I paint and I recently had a commission um, where I painted a cotton field. OK, it was a cotton field with the sunbeam shining down on the cotton and it was just a lovely landscape. And on my page, it said uh, if you were to advertise this, it may not. Um, it may not be allowed because it could be triggering. And obviously a bot, because I think I, you know, at some point maybe, I don't know if it recognized the picture or somebody on, on a feed said the word cotton. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, the, the name of the, name of the, um, of the piece is called Hope Shines On. Yeah. And that might not be able to be advertised because it could trigger people. Wow. <laughs> well, yeah, I actually, I took those kind of thoughts into consideration when I came up for the title of our show. I, I put it eyes wide shut in America and I thought, uh-oh, that America might be a, a, a word that gets me triggered. <laughs> well, yeah, and, but you know, not only that, actually, Eyes wide shut in America. It's really, really, we should change it to eyes wide shut in the West because it's all yeah. of the Western first world. It's all of Western civilization. It's all of those countries that have taken into account into account um, the age of enlightenment, the age of reason. Um, it's all of us that are under siege. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely. In fact, uh, your your co. Uh, Subjects, citizens, I don't know how you want to designate yourself. Citizens, I looked it up. I just, I got my passport. Well, you're actually a citizen. You okay. said that, sorry, I, I'm going to premise this. John and I were having a conversation. Uh, he said, well, you know, all all British citizens are not actually well, I didn't, subjects. I didn't say all. But my passport literally says British citizen. Yeah. Now they have different, de people don't understand the British system. They have different designations. And there, there are those that are subjects. There are those that are citizens. And there's a few other categories uh, relative to people within the Commonwealth. I should have my my husband Jay look up his passport to see if it's any yeah. different. Yeah, and and I mean, you know, I'm I'm obviously a, a naturalized citizen. Yeah. Um, even though, I mean, I've got my, you know, I've got both sides of my family have roots in England. Um, but see that, you know, I've gotten into to rows, as they would say, in, in yep. Britain, uh, with with friends like uh, a friend of mine. I, I won't I won't uh, call her out on here by name, but she was uh, a prominent. She's a prominent figure in pop music. In fact, she was with Eric Clapton for a while. I'll say that much. And no, it wasn't Sean Murphy. Sean's lovely. She's a wonderful person, but. Uh, I, I would get into these arguments with, with her, not Sean, but this other woman. In regards uh, to citizenry or, or being a subject? No, in regards to uh, this, the Second Amendment, you know. That oh, right, yep. He's like really, really uh, vehement that they, all, they have to take all the guns away. And well, I was anti-gun only a number of years ago. I was anti-gun. Sure. I've always been afraid of guns. Um, I didn't really understand. And in fact, after having so many years in England, um, let me just try and explain this. It's very interesting. When I first left America uh, back in, gosh, um, 87, I think it was. Um, I lived in Germany for the first bit, about a year or so. Um, <clears throat> so when I first left, um, after a few months in Europe, I just thought, oh, I, I never want to go back to America. I love it here. And Europe was great to me. My career was great, everything. So after a quite a long time of living in Europe and, and England and then becoming a citizen, I really had no desire to move back to America. And I started to see America from a completely different viewpoint that even you, John, I mean, even with all of your, um, your studies, I mean, I do see you as an, an intellectual and academic, um, 
you can't understand the viewpoint unless you are there, unless you live there for a long time. And I'm not talking about a year. I'm not talking about four years. I'm talking about you need to live there for nearly as long as I did, a generation, to really understand how you view America from the outside looking in. And it's a completely different situation. And the, the thing is in England, getting back to this, um, they view America kind of like this sort of gung-ho wild west, like this kind of gun-toting wild west, like, hey, you know, I'm macho and I got my gun, you know? <laughs> and and so, and they just see that as, um, you know, just ultimately really just uncivilized in a sense, you yeah. know? Um, and, in, and in fact, if you look at Europe, if you look at Previous to now, we've got other problems in Europe with um, the mass, uh, uh, I'm not even going to call it immigration, with the invasion into Europe. Um, and, I, and I emphasize the word invasion. Um, it, Europe used to be very, very civilized. In fact, I will say that Europe is more or was more civilized than America. America is a new country. Um, by comparison. So there is a real difference that I you it's it's difficult to explain really but to say Even when you meet people that are young that are European, okay, N not the immigrants But the Europeans that have been there for centuries and centuries and centuries Even when you meet them young, it's like they there's a certain sort of um, gravitas that they have. It's like they carry the weight of the centuries with them. And there's something different about the New Worlders, if you're talking about the Americans, the Canadians, the um, Australians, the New Zealanders. It, it's it's some, something about them moving to the New World. They're not carrying that same weight with them. It's yeah. very interesting. Well, it's kind of, it, 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 to, to bring it to a different scale, it's kind of like, uh, well, when I was in high school, uh, in, the, in the next couple of years after I graduated, I had this whole circle of people that I was friends with, you know, we were all hippies together or whatever. And most of them moved to California. Yeah. You know? Well, look at me. And, I've got my whole hippie thing going on right now. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and and it's the identity thing is that they what they once they got to California, they could be whoever they want. They let they were able to leave their past behind, you know. Yeah. And well, that's and why they, people on the East Coast say all the freaks end up in California. Yeah, the <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's interesting because I, I used to feel quite offended at that, you know, some of the sort of more um uh patrician uh, people on the East Coast, like oh, California, <laughs> bunch of freaks, you know, bunch of freaks and people that belong to cults are out there, right? Yeah. And um, I mean, I used to get this a few times from people in New York and whatever, you know. And um, but it's very interesting because if you look at it, this whole old um, adage of you know, go west, go west and make your fortune, and you kind of tend to think, well, you know, these people kind of, you know, they came over from Europe and then they kept going West because things weren't working out. And it's like, by the time they got to California and the West coast, like, Oh, we can't go any further. So we better damn well make it work here. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, then they start getting desperate. It's like, what do we do? You know, Oh, let's do an occult. Let's be a freak. Let's do whatever, whatever we have to do to be successful. Yeah. I see. Of course, Hollywood would be here. Of course. Right. Yeah. It's like it's like where's my group? Yeah, I'm I'm naked, you know. It's it's, <laughs> always, it's interesting because uh, people that they, they, they always talk about how they you know do your own thing. They want to be an individual, but the first thing they do is they try to find a group identity where they feel comfortable because yeah. it gives them like this zone of comfort. Oh, I'm not alone. There's all these people here, and they all seem to think. Uh, along similar lines as I do, you know, and it, it's it's all has to do with with uh, losing your your identity. Yeah, um, you know. collectivism, groupthink, the whore, yeah. the masses, and the the code word for them, which makes it all acceptable, is the word 
democracy, but it does, it's not democracy. It's, it's, well, it is, it's straight democracy. It's mob rule. It's group think. It's all of those things. And, you know, to some extent, look, conservatives, we tend to want to think similarly in the respect of, you know, we tend to value freedom over or freedom individu and individualism over collectivism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I still believe that conservatives tend to be more free thinkers because we tend to think more laterally rather than linearly. We're not afraid to, um, to uh, step outside that to discover whatever truths might be um, there to discover. Well, and, and that's kind of a, a, a recent phase in the perception of conservatism. Because if, if, if you look at the history of the conservative movement in America, conserving has to do with not changing, that keeping things as they are. And so consequently, back in the 60s, uh, people were gravitating to the left. And the whole right. idea- They want to push back against tradition and against what they considered to be the establishment. The establishment, right. And, and but the, the really the, the free thinking and, and freedom of the press movement was centered in Berkeley, California, which is really the epicenter of, of a lot yeah. of insanity that's going on now that is has to do with everything but freedom. And so it's- They threw the baby out with the bathwater there, didn't they? They really yeah. did. Well, it's, it's, and again, if, if you get into some of their playbooks, you see that it fits right into the narrative. And, and, and they, but they want to use these expressions of, of right and left in, in a quasi meaningful way, not knowing uh, the, how these terms developed. And yeah. it goes back to uh, the, uh, back to France, and so you have the Estates General. And so you have the first estate is the church, and the second estate is the, the king and the nobility. And the nobility sit to the right side of the king, and then you have the third estate is the, the people, the, the common people, and they sit on the left. So the whole idea of the left has to do with the common people that are sitting on the, on the what would be the left side of, uh, although I'm showing using my right hand, but, but uh, the left side of the king is the, is, is the populace, the, the common people. But, and yet modern conservative movement is, is what they're describing as populist. So you, in, in, see, in using these terminologies can be very confusing. It, it can so they, be. They, let me finish this, because it's very important. Okay. So they want to, to, to try and show that there's like communism is, is uh, on the left, and then you have a fascism on the right, which actually that's not true at all. Right. The, the, the fascists were social democrats, and they were a socialist movement. Uh, Mussolini was a famous uh, as a socialist, and it's just a, there's a, it's a different brand of socialism because your your Soviet system was government totalitarian, whereas fascism is corporate totalitarian. And, they, and what we're going through right now it really has more in in keeping with with that uh, fascist line of thinking. And so the and do you think? I think it's actually a combination of the two. Well, it is. It's always. It always is. Yeah, but you see that the, the the multinational new world order is corporate. Yes, it's it's, it's directly uh, developed out of a whole system that, that we described in detail on American intelligence media yes. for innovation, with a crime line going back uh, like twenty years or so. Yeah, as to how that this what what does uh, big new Brzezinski. He gave it a name back in in the late '60s. He called it a technocracy, mm -hmm. and that's that's what we're going into now, which is yep. a, a government uh, corporate partnership. Yes, you know, you know they, they always talk about public and private partnerships. Well, that's that's Don't not. Do you good. find it interesting though how the left think that they are the people? Um, you know, this the the common man. 
when they are directly aligned with this technocracy. They are on the side of the state, the, the corporations. They are part of it. And they don't realize at some point this all turned upside down and they don't realize the the way they're viewing it is is just it's just not accurate it's just totally inaccurate <laughs> I, I i see that uh an entertainer professional entertainer signed to the same company as led zeppelin we just lost him as a follower i, I he said god bless your stereotypes well uh yeah that and again that a uh, perfect uh, proof in the pudding right there because uh, our friend has, has stopped thinking uh, and, and is, hasn't gotten any further than the word. And so remember we started this conversation out talking about labels. As soon as you can label something, then you don't have to really think. And that's what we're, we're, we're doing this to get past that. He's I, yeah, and, and us and doing I, that. I, and I, I, might, I might oversimplify things and well, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. And see, for example, uh, let me let me share you something. This, if I could find it here, it's, I I know I pulled it up. Here it is. Uh, we can we can look back and, uh, for example, what's going on right now? They want to defund and eliminate police departments. Okay, that kind of crazy talk. Well. It, has that ever happened before? Is well, it's interesting because in 1933, uh, Hitler appointed uh, Hermann Göring as Minister of the Interior, and the first order he gave was to defund and eliminate the police departments so that they didn't interfere with the brown shirts, who had a mission to to basically go out and and create mayhem in order to affect the elections. So, see, it, it's <laughs> that, the same that, that sound like something. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's that same playbook. Yeah. And so consequently, uh, we have to be very, very careful because what they're trying to do is they're trying to trigger us. And, and hey, I love all these people. They're human beings, you know. I mean, I, I may not like uh, them. I may not want to hang out with them. But I, I try to include uh, – the concept of love is something that that's, has to do with transcending uh, just your personal realm, yeah. and and uh, that may sound high flying and 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 pseudo whatever to anybody. Yeah, I don't because I'm not I there. A hard time. I, 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 I used I've to never had a problem with 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 a program. <laughs> I mean, even just you know, when I first came out as a conservative, I was more. I, I hate to say it. I mean, maybe I really I shouldn't be proud of this, but I was more tolerant then. I thought, you know, um, in in the entertainment world, um, if somebody is a progressive or whatever, you know, as as long as they do their job, I'm happy to work with them. But honestly, now I don't know if I'd want to work with a hardcore progressive. I don't. I don't. I don't think I could. I, I just. I have no. I just. I. I would love to be able to change their mind. I would love to be able to have them, uh, us both have a conversation to try and get them to see a little bit of a fuller picture. And they just, they just won't. Well, you see, here's, here's the point I, I try to make. I don't endorse people. And, and people yeah. say, well, why is that? I say, well, because th I know they're going to disappoint me. <laughs> well, 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 people, what, what would be the reason to endorse anybody, really? You well, know, well, Trump, well, Trump is flawed as hell. Yeah, I, I endorse I endorse ideas and, and like I support President Trump. He's our president. He was yes. elected president, and I endorse him to the extent that he uh, proceeds along a line that I think is a good idea. Yes, I, I and, agree. Which he doesn't always do. And, right. and, and, and right, I mean, because are we going to support every single thing he says and does? No, I I haven't. I haven't supported everything he says and does. And the thing he said about George Floyd in heaven looking, to, oh my God, <laughs> that yeah. was terrible. He shouldn't have said that. Oh, geez. You know, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, he's a flawed human, right? Yeah, he's a, he's a flawed human and he's, 
in, in his area of expertise, he's doing an incredible job. Yes. Uh, Wes is, Wes is cotton socks, as, as they say in England. <laughs> yeah. Wes yes. is cotton socks. That's nice. Um, but if you look at it and you see that uh, Washington is a very, very odd bubble. And, and, and I go back uh, like years ago, man. Back in the, the late 70s, a friend of mine returned from Washington where she had been working uh, as a lobbyist and also uh, working as an associate with, with Walter Mondale and all, did all this stuff in Washington. And she came back to Detroit and we, we let her stay at our house for a while while she came in for a landing. And, but she wouldn't talk about Whenever I'd asked her about Washington, because I thought it's very interesting, you know, I've always sure. been interested. And she would get this terrified look and wouldn't talk about it. It was as if she had escaped from something that was just so god awful, horrible, that, that she was afraid to talk about it. Wow. But, and I found that really, to this day, I just find it hauntingly disturbing because. The look on her face, you can't make that up. I mean, she was genuinely terrified. And, well, there's a lot of... knows what it was. You know, people that are hungry for power and control tend to congregate in government. I mean, that's a given. And so it, it would stand to reason that there's a lot of dark people in positions of power. Um, and I think that's why a lot of us do support Trump because we see that he's not a dark individual. Yeah, yeah, I, I think he, he's he's well intended, and it also is encouraging to me his his wife Melania, I think who's who's really uh, quite a brilliant woman from as yeah. far as I could tell, and uh, and being a European, she yeah. sees America from the outside in, as I was saying to you. Yeah, and she has personal. It's, it's, a, it's a different perspective, and um, and I can tell you the the Europeans that look to America, the the conservative or the populist Europeans look to America. And I have a lot of European friends, a lot of British friends, um, and they look to us, and they look to Trump, and they look to what the conservative movement as really the the last great hope for the world. And um, you know, in the respect of what's going on right now, if if you're if if America falls, if the United States falls, yeah, that's that's the big chip, and one of the main reasons we haven't fall fallen is that we still have a Second Amendment. Yeah, I was just going to do this. And we're <laughs> struggling with the First Amendment. At, at we least. are, and uh, it should be interesting to see what happens regarding. Uh, the censorship on social media, yeah, which is really a key point. And and again, uh, if you, if you look at it, what what came about with WikiLeaks and that whole development, uh, you see that uh, for for example, I wish that uh, President Trump would get on the right side of Julian Assange because that there's there's no criminal basis there according to the principles of, of American yeah. legal uh, system as it's supposed to be, yeah. that, that there would be any reason to have any prosecution of, of Julian Assange yeah. whatsoever. So uh, that's that's disturbing to me. I, I think one of the most disturbing things. I, I think he's in a very, very difficult situation because he's surrounded um, and it's, I think it's difficult for him to navigate and it's a bit of a push-pull where um, there's certain areas where he will just kind of, um, you know, ease up and other areas where he, he pushes his way. And it's, um, you know, so we aren't going to be 100% thrilled with everything that happens moving forward, you know. Yeah, that's, again, you know, I mean, it goes back. Uh, to Lord Lord Acton, the 19th century, uh, but the and you hear this saying over and over again. But Lord Acton, uh, he was a, a Catholic 
British uh, lord, and he said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Absolutely. The short version. But the saying is, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, powerful men are almost always bad men. So there you have it. I mean, you, people aren't developed enough in, in, in terms of, of the evolution of consciousness right. to, to, to be responsible enough to have that much power. And right. that, that's the that's the stickler right there. It, which is why we have limited power in this country, and which is why we need term limits for our yeah. congressmen. Uh, we yeah, have this rare, rare politicians. I mean, it's it's not good. It's not good at all. We need to. Uh, what? Uh, I, you know, I just put out a post just to change the subject quickly. I just put out a post. Um, I think yesterday or the day before about the new country of Chaz in Seattle. Oh, geez. And <laughs> I, I do believe because they, because of how we um, ended up in this place, you know, we had Trump succumbing to what Fauci was saying and we had this lockdown. Um, and then we had the George Floyd incident which was like, at, after the lockdown, after two months of being locked down, we were like a tinderbox. And all you needed was one little thing to set it off. And that was the incident with George Floyd. And so now we're, it's just, it's on a roll. And it's just, uh, so you've got this, this uh, new country of Chaz. <laughs> Um, but there's going to be more Chazes. That, that was my post, that there are going to be more Chazes popping up not just in in the U.S. but uh, throughout the West, um, as as these as this kind of mob rule continues um, towards the direction of totalitarianism. Um, I've got my theories, but what do we do? Because well, we cannot continue to just say, "Oh, let's just let them have their way." That's just their way. It's their way of doing things, and we'll just continue on in our classical liberal way of let's have our way and, and you know, it'll be fine. It's not fine. And we need to do something about it. If Trump does anything about it, he will be immediately labeled, well, as he already is probably, um, you know, a Stalinist, murderous dictator. If that's, he, what they're, that's what yeah. they're trying to trigger. Yes, exactly. And I think, you know, Trump is playing a very smart chess game because he's not doing it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, the, the same token, people saying, why doesn't he go in and do this? You know, and, you know, he did uh, move in that direction. Uh, he gave indications to the Department of Defense to, to try and reestablish uh, security using military forces. And he was publicly uh, criticized yeah. uh, within, the, within the military itself from and that's not their job, by the way. Is to, I know. You know, and so he needs to bring in a new head of the Department of Defense. And yeah, he needs to but, but it's, you know, um, see, this, this comes down to, I guess, the way I look at it um, is that it's actually not Trump's job at this point. I think it's the job of we the people. Well, it, there is that, and that's the election, but they're trying to prevent us from having an actual election where you go vote, they want to. No, I, I, no, I'm, I'm. It's not having the. My viewpoint, for what it's worth, is I don't think the election is going to make any difference in the trajectory of what's going on. Whether he wins or loses, it's not going to make any difference in the trajectory, um, because the 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 left will continue to push back until. I say the left. I'm. We know who we're talking about. I, I'm just going to say the left because it's for discussion. It just makes it slightly easier. Um, no, I'll change it. The mob. OK, the mob will continue to push back until there is no more individualism. There is no more freedom. Um, and even if Trump loses, they will continue to push and we, until we are annihilated um, and I believe that we are in a war now. I mean, this is a civil war. We, we, we're here. We're already here. 
but this is all this is all, this is all a part of, of a larger plan and 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 they try to give it the appearance as if this is like something that's just spontaneously coming about because this is what people want right um, but, but, but that's and the the minions that are protesting and rioting and well Let's just talk about the protesters. The protesters are protesting because they think it's about equality and police brutality. Um, but it's not that. It's a front for that. And they're pawns. Yeah. Well, the rioters are being paid by those at the top that want to continue to destabilize so that they can continue in their rise to power for you know the globalist elites that are behind the mob. The looters, they're just kind of thinking, hey, more stuff for me and I'm not gonna get caught, so I'm going. So those people, the looters and the, and the, the protesters, they're just pawns that are helping to drive this thing forward. Um, the rioters are paid pawns um, and what we really need to look at is, as you said before, who's the head of the snake? Yeah. Uh, that's, obviously that's, it's Soros, it's the Clintons, it's the Obamas, it's all of those people. Um, yes, uh, and, it, and it has very specific links to uh, the UK, the city of London. In particular. Yeah, you were saying that. I still haven't looked into that. I need to read more about that. I'm not going to agree or disagree. I, I I always find it really difficult when England. Well, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll give you an assignment. Go go to uh, Americans for Innovation. Uh, it's a Americans number four innovation. We'll now, put it in the link so that other people can read it yeah, too. I will, but Americans for Innovation dot dot com, and look up Lord Mark Malik Brown. Lord Mark Malik Brown is the co-founder with George Soros of the Open Society Foundation. Okay. And he and Lord Mark Malik Brown is one of the leaders of the Queen's Privy Council. Mm. The operations that, that have been going on against President Trump to a large extent have been coming out of London. Uh, and I, I really don't want to get into it. We, maybe yeah. we'll do another <laughs> show. Regarding that, right now we're just kind of uh, getting. Our I, I, I intrinsically don't believe that documents and details, and it's. Uh, I, you know, I, I never talk about it on the media ever. Yeah, I'm supportive of the Queen. I've, in fact, I, I don't know if you know this, but when you become a British citizen, <laughs> you have to swear allegiance to the Queen. Of course, see. Um, see? And. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know I, it's it's tricky, isn't it? I, I remember doing that and then saying to the uh, the lawyer or the notary when I was sworn in, I said, "Am I okay doing this?" <laughs> I mean, because I'm also an American citizen, and you know what he said to me? He said, "Well, we won't tell if you won't." <laughs> yeah, and that's and like, I, I, I shouldn't take it lightly. I I do still believe that um, that the um, the majority um, in the UK are our allies, and and like I said, all of the West. I love, I love the populace uh, of the West. They are our, our allies. I taught I taught cultural history uh, in a master's program, college level, uh, for a time, and uh, I one of my central focuses throughout my life has has been my love and fascination with. British history and, and all of that. So don't get me wrong, I love the British people. And yeah, me too. You know, me too. I grew up with the Beatles, you know. I, I, I adore England and yeah. England was great to me. And uh, and I yeah. I and do I do love the Queen. I, I don't think I, I think that you know, like Trump, okay. So Trump has people that are seemingly his allies, um, that are Republicans or seemingly conservative but they're snakes. And, and I think the same goes for the queen. She's got people around her that are, uh, that are for lack of a better word, evil. And, well, so, yeah. and so does any leader that is trying to do good, um, they're gonna have evil, evil people amongst them. And I'm sure that, you know, with respect to the woman that was staying with you, um, she was just surrounded by some very evil people. And uh, I think that's probably why she was so afraid. Well, I, again, uh, 
nobody really knows the, the nature and extent of the Queen's relationship to all of, all of this nonsense. But nonetheless, uh, you could say what you want, but if you look under the hood, and you know, I think we'll do this some other time, we'll do a specific broadcast regarding yeah. that, the city of London and all. It's fascinating stuff. And you know, I mean, on one hand, we're talking about with what's going on right now, you know, looking at cutting off the head of the snake. Yeah. But I also think we need to cut off the tail end too and the middle. I mean, we need to just chop that thing up. <laughs> well, chop that thing up until there's nothing left. Um, and part of that is, you know, we have we have so many different areas that need looking at academia, Hollywood, um, uh, the the news media, um, journalists. I mean, there's so many different areas that need addressing that yeah. we cannot continue to just sort of let them be and let them continue. I, yeah. I'm just so concerned about the younger yes. generations because we remember, John. We remember what America used to be like. Yeah. And and yeah. you know, again, and all my English friends, they remember what England used to be like. Yeah. It's it is it's unrecognizable now. Well, yeah, a, a woman was arrested recently in in the UK for something she said by email through her Gmail account. Oh yeah, right. I mean, is that creepy? It doesn't surprise me, and this is why I'm again on my page. I've been suggesting to people that if they're gonna have sensitive information, which they should, because I do believe that we the people, and I, I'm inclusive in the respect of all the people that have uh, a love of freedom and individualism like us, um, if we are gonna have any sort of sensitive conversations, we need to do this on safe, um, uh, it, from safe sources. So I've suggested to people to, if they're gonna do instant messaging, find a very, very secure, encrypted instant messenger. Do your research as to who owns that instant messenger. If you think that going to WhatsApp and uh, talking on that, even though it says it's encrypted, don't believe it. It's owned by, is it Facebook or Google? One of those. So, you know, your Gmail account owned by Google, the enemy, as far as I'm concerned, right? So if you're going to have sensitive information, you do not want a Google account or a Gmail account to be doing that. You don't want a server that um, is open. You you know, you really need to protect yourself from the ground up. You By really way, it, it, worse. We're we're just at the beginning of this conflict. Yeah, if you want if you really want to fly under the radar, what you have to do is you have to buy another computer and go to uh, like say Starbucks or something that has Wi-Fi, and create a whole subsystem uh, just for that purpose, and get a Proton Mail or some sort of secure email, and all, you know, uh, all, all of which I, I haven't pursued myself because I being I a, 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 it, but then I'm not, you know, right now. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say no, but. Um, I'm not, you know, leading any sort of charge, but I, I do yeah. think that I, I do think that we need to organize and I need to we need to organize, you know, not just online, but we need to organize physically in in, in regions. And I, well, I, I, think, I that's think that we need to be more active because the problem with so many conservatives and libertarians is that we have this idea of, OK, we don't want government involvement. Therefore, we're not going to be involved and we're just going to live our lives and let other people do what they're going to do. Um, and, you know, we try and make our own lives better by looking within and try and, you know, make ourselves better, make our, our, our families better and our immediate community of, you know, our friends and acquaintances and doing it that way. Whereas a lot of people on the other side um, they don't want to look within, so they look without to fix things from without. So they are the ones that are gravitating towards um, positions of influence and, and governmental positions and, and journalistic positions because they want to change the outside world, thinking that that will help change within, but they never look there. Yeah, they, they, they want to come up with some kind of uh, system that's going to, like... Uh, 
be a palliative for them. That's that's good. Uh oh, you just stopped, John. I don't see you. Oh dear. Well, I don't know if I'm still on or not, or anybody's still watching, but this is a bummer. I much prefer having a, a conversation here. Um, I am going to get back to you and find out what's going on. Are you there, John? Oh, here we go. I think he's yeah, coming back. I get rid of this other, the other me. I don't know what happened. Maybe somebody- oh, Wait a minute. What I was saying. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, in any event, uh, hey. we, okay. I don't know what you know, happened. <laughs> my, my browser just crashed. You know, yeah. it's never done that before. And I don't know if I was still on or not, so I kind of kept talking. But anyway, what were we saying? What was yeah. the? I don't know. Uh, my browser crashed. Uh, yeah, the, I, it kind of disrupted. Interesting, it crashed, isn't it? It's like yeah. Ooh. So, <laughs> outside forces. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I maybe I triggered a subroutine in some subsystem somewhere, but you know, I, I again, I, I I basically describe it is is uh, there's two kinds of people. There's people that want to be left alone, and then there's the people that want to tell other people what to do. You know, and they that they have a much better idea about how you should run your life than you do. See, yeah, um, which is interesting because that's a complete reversal of what. The people that that uh, got involved in in uh, what people would call liberalism back in the '60s was whole idea of that they wanted their freedom from the establishment and and all of that. And now, like we've talked about earlier, that this is inverted, and, and they want to uh, somehow. Mine, did, did you just, it just stopped again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but you're back. You're back. Okay. So, anyways, well, I think this is a this is a good start. I don't want to wear out every line of thinking here. Yeah. If there's any kind of a, a closing thoughts, do, you, do if somebody wants to contribute to your undertaking, do you have a PayPal account or, or anything? Um, like that? You know, I do have a PayPal account just under my name, Julianne Davis. You can find me pretty easily. Okay, so um, uh, pay, PayPal. I haven't. I you know. I, and can I can I just say one thing though? Yeah. I um, the reason I've done this, I, I'm you know I I'm not trying to put a halo over my head or anything like this. But the reason I've done this has not been to um, you know for money or to um, kind of career path. Yeah, you yeah. know, kind of, uh, mm -hmm. propel myself into this other region of fame or anything. I, it's really not <laughs> about that. I I'm purely doing it. I mean hand on heart. I purely say this and do this because um, I care about freedom. I care about Western civilization and I believe in Western civilization and I'm actually getting emotional just thinking about it. I'm very, very concerned for um, the future of humanity. As you I'm, should be. I'm hugely concerned. Yeah. And I do it for that reason. That's all. Um, I've, I've been largely blacklisted from my, um, my acting career. I've lost a lot of friends, uh, acquaintances. Um, yeah, it's been tough, you know, it's been tough, but, um, I do it because, um, I, you know, I believe in freedom. I believe in goodness. Um, and I, and I want that to win in the end and everything I do, everything I do is for that. That's it. Yeah. That, and that's one of the reasons why I, I, I tapped you on the shoulder to see if you'd be interested in doing this. Cause I, yeah. I knew that, that, uh, that's where you were coming from. And just for that being said, I had never mentioned anything to you before about anything regarding PayPal or anything like that. I mean, look, I'm, I'd be thrilled to bits if somebody wants to send me money, that would be super fantastic, but I'm not asking for it. I'm not expecting yeah. it. That's fine. I, 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 it's not my, um, okay. yeah, I, it's, uh, at this point. So I think that, uh, if, if people want to contribute to me, it's, it's, uh, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. And also you could well, check. I would say you can just find me, I think by typing in Julianne Davis. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 
And uh, you could also check out my, my Twitter thread where I have the Crown Gate thread parked at the top of my Twitter in which I give links to a lot of the documents that I'll be making reference to. And uh, it gives you the storyline uh, in an in exceedingly long thread because I keep adding to it. I'm over 250 entries, but I give you the whole history of the cabal. Okay. Uh, and, and the Catholic in fact, please um, send all that to me and I can share it on all of my social yeah, media. Right, right. right there is my, my okay. Twitter. Okay. And so this has been delightful talking to you. It's been great. It's been fantastic. Always is. And um, I love doing it. A lot of people said, you know, I should be doing a podcast. But honestly, I'm not I'm not good like, say, someone like Stefan Molyneux is, where he can just sit there and stare at himself yeah. and just talk for an hour. I can't do that. I'm better in a in a in a conversation like this. I I just get too segued. Um with my thinking, it, it's not cohesive enough without somebody else to bounce off of. So I, I appreciate the opportunity of being able to have these discussions. I think they're important. And um, yeah, let's do it again. Excellent. Well, I, I think you have a very uh, relevant voice in the world today. And I think that there's a lot of people that, that like the way in which you approach your ideas because you're so sincere. And, Thank you. Thank you. And I try to make things more simple, you know, I mean, not to say that the masses are all stupid, but um, you, you just want to uh, be able to make it uh, bite sized, you know, that you can you can take it in and. Are you freezing? Digest it fairly, but all I do is the best I can do. And this is what I do. And, and anybody who might be interested. This is uh, one of my books, The Arcana of the Grail Angel. And uh, the spiritual science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, in which I uh, portray the history of the Christian of the Holy Grail that leads to the Knights Templar and the Rosicrucians. And, and that's the central core of the esoteric basis of Western culture. That is so fascinating to me as well. I've, I've read a little bit about that, and yeah, it's and absolutely the, fascinating. And the sequel to that is the Arcana of Light on the Path. They're both, both available on eBay. Uh, don't try to get them on Amazon. Somebody's trying to hawk my books for $1,000 a copy. Oh, know. my gosh. Yeah, I know. Well, and that's the thing. Um, we need to break all these uh, conglomerates up. We need to do this. I've, yeah. I've just... Kind of segued over to um, Parlor, and I think I've joined another thing, VK. I've only just got a holding place there for now, but I kind of want to get off Facebook. I kind of want to get off Twitter, and we need to give more power to more. Um, I don't want to say the word power; that's the wrong word. We need to spread this around so that we don't have this kind of monopoly that Facebook and Twitter have. Those monopolies are not good. What do we say about power? Ultimate power corrupts absolutely. So yeah, especially when you when you consider that uh, my friend Michael McKibben is the one who invented social media and it was stolen from him through the Eclipse Foundation and involving all the whole cast of characters of, of Eric Schmidt and Bill Gates and and all of these. We can get into that sometime. There's yeah. a Still. We're not, we're not going to run out of content. It's <laughs> never. If, it, if it's never run out of content. I mean, look at this universe. There's so much here. There is so much. I, you know, that's what I get. I don't, I, I don't have time to be bored. Yeah, exactly. How could you be? Well, you know, but I think, but the reason is though, is that we, um, we like to examine things. We like to examine our own lives within and without, you know, examine the world, the universe, people, history, the future, all of these things. We, we, and, and, and again, this is part of, part of the human journey, our, our, our journey while we're here on this earth. Yeah. yeah excellent. Well, it's, it's, it's a pleasure and I look forward to our next episode. Okay. And all the people that came, uh, to, to peek in, I didn't announce it. I, this is just very off the cuff thing. Yeah, uh, we will be doing oh, links later, right? Yeah. Later. And it'll be available and, and 
people can find it on YouTube and Facebook. And uh, again, I want to wish uh, President Trump uh, a happy birthday and, and say yeah, hi to Melania. Happy birthday, Donald Trump. And I wish him well, and I hope that he can clear the snakes out of his garden. And Julian, thank you for joining, and uh, we'll see you uh, very soon. All right. Take care.